idea. So my name is Dick Sandler, and I'm a thoracic surgeon in Iowa. I have an interest in diving and diving safety, and we'll go through that journey in a moment, because that way you'll understand what we're talking about. Situational awareness is obviously safety military speak for what's going on around you and how important that is. And when you think about all the things and the endeavors that we do as physicians and healthcare providers and divers, you know, what we're doing, why we're doing it, is actually is of critical importance. So here we go. So quickly where I'm coming from on this, I've 32 years as a surgeon, 15 years in my surgery service committee, which was a wake-up call. It sounds very bland, but basically, why do surgeons do bad things and why do bad outcomes occur? Uh, my whole family dives. I'm the oldest diver, hence I'm the default family dive master. And so when you start taking responsibility for your children and your nieces and nephews, all of a sudden things become a little bit different. I'm director of hyperbaric services. Um, and then some years ago, and this is what started this, a dear friend of mine in the public safety dive community, a captain in the fire department, asked me to take over or be the medical director for the Dive Rescue International, the largest training agency for the public safety divers. And that's the fire and police and the FBI dive teams and things like that. Well, that sounds like fun. Okay, I'll do that. That's a cool job, you know. And, and they said, oh, by the way, when you take this job, we have a question for you. Why do so many public safety divers die? Okay, how, 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 how hard can that be? Well, <laughs> that was a wake-up call. In fact, it's the most dangerous diving job in the United States. It has a higher mortality rate than commercial diving, military diving, and certainly recreational diving. And in fact, it took us a long time to even have a hint of why people die. <clears throat> the bottom line, uh, this is not an all about me lecture, though. It's about hard lessons learned and what we want to try and share with all of you. Uh, we started the, this thing called the Alpha Safety Program. For those of you who recognize the dive flags, of course, the Alpha Program. That stuff on the right, Bravo and Zulo, that's the naval hoist for a job well done. And this is a talk I give to my hyperbaric people, to my own doctors at our surgery center where I'm safety officer, to other hospitals. And basically, it's beyond checklist, or actually what comes before a checklist. So when you get onto the dive boat, when you walk into the operating room, you know, where are you at? What are you thinking? Books you might want to read in this topic, uh, Situational Awareness by Micah Inslee. Very dry, very, very academic, but also spot on. Deep Survival and the Survivors Club are great reads to understand in situations of stress how people survive, and what they're thinking, what they did. Uh, another great book for you to read is Michael Ainge's book on Diver Down, just a list of diver accidents. Because when you read these, you realize that, oh my gosh, what were people thinking? I mean, there's not one of us in this room who wouldn't know to turn on his air of a scuba tank, would you? Nobody would not do that, and yet they do. So why does that occur? So what were they thinking? <clears throat> so the basic structure of situational awareness is level one, perception, level two, comprehension, level three, projection, projecting into the near future the consequences of what you're doing. Overlying all this is the role of goals, expectations, dual processing, and feedback. So a little bit of psycho speak here. It's a little psycho babble, but actually it gets to be pretty interesting. So let's go through examples of failure because all good talks start with history. That guy in your upper left is a guy named Clausewitz who wrote uh, On War, and he talked about things called the fog of war and friction. When the war starts, when the bullets start flying, somehow Things just fall apart. You don't know what's going on. For the Civil War buffs, Robert E. Lee at Gettysburg, he desperately needed Jeb Stuart to tell him what was going on, but Stuart was gone. So where was Stuart's cavalry? So Lee was left blind, and the North won. Uh, Mogadishu, fratricide, Delta versus Rangers. You know, in that horrible incident, we actually killed a few of our own guys. And yet nobody would think that the Rangers and Delta are either undertrained or undermotivated, because that's certainly not the case. And finally, um, down there, the U.S. Coast Guard Healy tragedy several years ago, when two divers died in the Arctic, and we'll get to that for a moment. There's a whole list of things that go on. What I'm going to try and dissuade you from is that, one, that you're not susceptible to this because you are. Number two, that we have some sort of process or checklist which will protect you because it won't. 
And so you're going to have to look internally to yourself and to your colleagues and your dive buddies and decide what works. The very first study, formal study really, that I could find on uh, situational awareness occurred after the um, <clears throat> 1972 uh, Eastern Airlines accident where an L-1011 flew into the Everglades. And what was interesting was they had gone around on a uh, gear check, had a nose light, or a little, little light in the cockpit that says nose gear wasn't down. And so they flew around and were trying to figure out why the nose gear wasn't down. And as they were working on the nose gear, they flew it directly into the Everglades, killing a number of people, including the pilots. And yet the voice cockpit recorder was very clear. The landing checklist was complete. Flaps, airspeed, gear, everything worked. The checklist was complete, but all the pilots, including the flight engineer, were so busy with their eyes in the cockpit that they didn't realize they actually flew it directly into the ground. <clears throat> Key words from the NTSB, please don't read it because it's, it's very boring, but failure, failure to monitor, failure to detect, preoccupation, distraction, okay? Things we've all done. Checklist was complete. Uh, recently, the Air France flight from Brazil to Paris, okay? Uh, the final report's in. They found the uh, black box, which is, of course, orange, and in fact, the pilots lost perception. They did not know the airspeed. They were not trained appropriately. They had the wrong input into the controls. They stalled and they crashed, okay? Human factors. <clears throat> USS Port Royal, a Ticonderoga class cruiser with nuclear missiles, uh, went aground outside Hawaii. When they went through it, somebody failed to start the cruise with an appropriate fathometer. They didn't know what was underneath them. Their navigation system was not turned on. Actually, it had been turned on, then turned off. Why would you turn off your automatic navigation system? Nobody knows, but everything worked. There's the damage there of the screws. I think it was around $200 million for the dry dock for this. Just drove it directly into a reef. Okay. Um, now, I, I will tell you that this picture is from the internet, although as a vascular surgeon, this is exactly uh, a case of mine, so it's a little bit of stealing here. But this is a case of mine that occurred. Um, this is part and partial to being a vascular surgeon. Fempop bypass graft, chop off the necrotic toes, put them in the chamber, just what we do every day. I walk in there, and we'd done the checklist, and we had been through the operative schedule, and everything matched. Every single thing matched. Everybody had said the right words. Everything was all set. And yet I walk in with my light on, gloves, you know, hands ready to go, and she's scrubbing the left leg. Now that's the right leg. And the veteran scrub nurse, or circulating nurse, is scrubbing out the left leg. I ask what's going on. Well, what's with this? Well, doctor, you've put a big red, black X on that right leg. As you know, we're supposed to do pre-site marking now. So there's a big X on that right leg. I thought that you were marking where the pulses were. And you would never operate on a leg with pulses. Okay, a little convoluted thinking, but this is a veteran nurse, okay. So we wonder how wrong site surgery occurs. Okay, the Healy incident, um, they were on a cruise on, in the Arctic. They had an ice liberty and the uh, officer diver decided to have a quick training dive under the ice. Um, only there was a few problems, like uh, thinking about what's going on. And uh, as you can see, the water temperature was a nice balmy 29 degrees. Those are our divers. And in the final commandant's report, there were over 30 errors of judgment. There was alcohol consumption on the ice. The tenders were not trained. It goes on and on and on and on and on. But what's more important is that there was no equipment failure. Um, everything fu functioned as well. There was no personnel impairment with the exception of the tenders who had been drinking and had been given permission to drink, I might add. <clears throat> there was no rescue equipment failure. Nothing went wrong except everything went wrong. And they had too much weight, wrong kind of fins, it goes on and on. So what were they thinking? What did all these have in common? They were all well-trained individuals. They were all well-intentioned individuals. And they were all virtually certain that they were doing well that day. Does anybody 
out there not think that you fit that category is well-intentioned, well-trained, working hard every day. So hopefully we'll dissuade you from the thought that you're not susceptible to this. I think yesterday there was a, a near head-on by two U.S. Air lines, okay. I, I have not seen the report, but I'm sure that air traffic control thought they said the right thing, and I'm sure the pilots thought they heard the right thing. Fidelity of training, this is public safety diving. Uh, looks pretty benign, but there's lots of questions here like, is this training or real exercise? How would you know? Who's this guy out there all by himself? Is there a tender? Does the tender have a life jacket? Are there safety lines, primary doctor, di diver, 90% diver? Is this what we call normalization of deviance, which we'll get to? In short, this just is not high fidelity training. And we're going to skip ahead for a second to another model. Have anybody heard of Swiss cheese, the Swiss cheese effect? Okay. Anybody work in a U.S. hospital? Somebody must, right? And what happens is that you have processes and you have paper and you have checklists and you have committees. And the idea is that somebody's backing up another person, backing up another person. So it's another slice of cheese. So that somebody's backing everybody up. But every now and then, those holes in the Swiss cheese align and something gets through. Very academic and dry stuff, but the point is that model doesn't really explain other than bad luck, how all these holes interact, about the psychopathology of all the things going on in terms of the relationship. And it's obscure, but kind of important as we move along. You'll get there. True story, my hospital, OK? Patient had a spinal operation, developed a blood clot by the spine. Uh, RNs come in, and she realizes that, you know, I'm not going to check the patient because the doctor is going to make rounds, so she moves ahead. So she doesn't check the neuros. Doctors in a rush comes in, sees all his patients. Well, certainly the nurses would have told me if there was something wrong, moving ahead. Patient then does develop a sensation of being unable to move their legs. So the rapid response care team is called. Only they're delayed because it's not a cardiac arrest, so they have other things to do. And at the end of the day, the patient was left paralyzed. So all the holes in that Swiss cheese lined up really nicely. Uh, the three-way repeat back, you've heard that in communications. Say something, somebody reads it back, the nurse reads back the orders that you just said. Air traffic control does the same thing, makes sense, works. <clears throat> Head-on collision in Brazil a couple years ago, a commercial jet and a corporate jet. Uh, when they reviewed the air traffic control tapes, everything was just perfect. Everybody read back just like they were supposed to read back, and the process was followed completely. Checklist shortcomings, we heard about checklists yesterday. I believe in checklists, I use them all the time, but they will not save you, okay? It's a short-term memory aid, but it doesn't address comprehension and projection. It's a static thing because it's developed prior to the event. And what we know is that the situational awareness engine needs to be dynamic. Remember now the Eastern Airlines flight checklist was complete. So it's never complete enough. It never addresses the problem of scanning for more data. It doesn't add meaning to the data that you get. It doesn't show you how to connect the dots, okay. So when we go through all these processes, more paper, more committee meetings, more slices of cheese, all these things, and yet it's not really solving our problem. And that's because we know that most of these things are human factors. So that's where the talk is going, situational awareness and your human factors. You look at the Navy's experience. This is from one of their papers. Um, it was published in um, it was Aviation, Human Factors Magazine, yeah. And uh, looked at 263 dive accidents. And the official report was that um, you know, diver, uh, human error was the number one cause, but the majority, we don't know why. And yet when you interview the divers involved, the, the five top reasons according to the divers are complacency, fatigue, and experience poor training, poor planning, all virtually all human factors. So how do these failures come about? How do we change ourselves? How do we get this situational awareness? So a quick primer on cognitive sciences. Short-term memory, we all have it, and all of us don't have much of it. You know, we need a, a RAM upgrade and we can't buy any. You know, I cannot give you a string of 16 numbers and expect you to memorize them. A uh, seven-digit phone number you know, is about as good as you can get. And in reality, we now know it's about four. So on a short-term basis, 
you just can't remember that much. It involves the frontal cortex, a bunch of other anatomy, but the point is it's got limited capacity. We also don't think out of the box well. This is a classic psych experiment. Here's the directions. Connect all those dots with as few lines as possible. Okay. That's the response most people give, five lines. Okay, you connect all the dots with five lines. But actually, if you think outside the box, and you just literally are outside the box there, is that? But we have, we have biases, we have restraints. We put ourselves in a box because we're used to doing things, in this case, following the exact directions. But I didn't say you had to follow the exact directions. I just said you had to use, use some lines. We have a thing called the supervisory attention system. Uh, it helps us manage emergent situations, particularly in five distinct situations. Decision making, error correction, novel se uh, sequences, dangerous environments, and overcome habituate responses. So this is what gets us out of trouble. Trouble has got a built-in eight second delay. So in an emergency, if you're confronted with a bunch of new data, our buffering system takes about eight seconds until we're able to make a cognitive, well thought out plan. But that eight seconds just may be critical in what you're doing. And why do you have that delay? Well, you have to process the information. Uh, it allows you to model things. It allows you to project into the future. So it's, it's a great tool, but it does have its limits. Hence, at the bottom, I talk about like helicopter ditching training. There is something they teach where it's a learned response, where if you're in a helicopter that's going down in the ocean, you're not going to figure out right then what the right thing to do is. You need to have been taught the right thing to do. Okay. So mental models, good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, mental models, what you think you're doing that day because you're used to it. Driving to work, for instance. You know, it guides attention. It, it reduces memory demands because this is something you've done before. It allows integration of perceived information. Allows projection of future states. It's good. Trouble is it also encourages selection bias. You're used to seeing what you're used to seeing, and you're used to thinking about what you're used to thinking about. And so when new data comes in, something novel occurs, you may not be quite there in where you be unless you're really focused that day. So we have things like pattern matching, expectations, automaticity and goals. I'm going to move quickly because this is a shortened talk. But let's talk about biases, okay, cognitive biases. These are things that we all do because we think we know what we're doing, but in fact, we don't. Every one of these um, probably occurs to all of us at some point. The, probably the most common in the United States is gambler's fallacy, and that's because people play lotto. The gambler's fall fallacy as well. I've played so much that I'm bound to win someday, right? Except you're not because each draw of the lotto is a separate, independent event totally unrelated to the last ones. Okay? And yet, obviously, tens of millions of people participate in that every day. So this guy is demonstrating that everybody makes bad decisions. Okay? And he's no exception. Um, he's probably a surgery resident. You know, like this. I speak from experience. So <clears throat> human, human beings are hardwired uh, with our limitations. And we continue to make these bad decisions. So how do we get out of this? What were you thinking? So let's talk about situational diving, uh, situational awareness and diving. Probably should read this. The perception of the elements in the environment within a volume of time and space, the comprehension of their meaning, and the projection of their status into the near future. So what's going around you? And then as an expert, and this is what experts have, can you immediately figure out what this means to you and what you're going to do in the next 8, 10, 12, 60 seconds? Very, very important in those areas where you have a high workload, high risk, high consequence situation, such as surgery, such as aviation, such as diving. Okay, so it's a useful tool to have. Academically, we want to give credit where credit's due. What's really interesting though is reading the old literature, and here's why. In the 1970s, a guy named John Boyd, Lieutenant Colonel in the Air Force, developed a thing called the OODA loop. For those of you who are in the military, they're still teaching this at Quantico. They're probably teaching it somewhere in the Navy, I suspect. But it's a tactical situation for staying ahead of your enemy. 
Um, then Gary Klein came around in the 80s and he started thinking about sense making and a thing called recognition prime decision making. Anybody here in fire or police service? Okay, that's, the, that's sort of what they go by. They don't go with a plan all the time because they recognize that the experienced battalion chief on a fire call out, he's been there, done that, he knows what to do. RPDM. And that worked. But that still leaves you short. So then along came Mike Inslee. And there you see the sequence through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s of where we are in terms of thinking about emergencies. But what's really interesting about all of those, let me go back for a moment. Back, I said. <sighs> Let's see if we can do that. There we go. It, when you read their literature, and I wish I could make my laser work, he mentioned the word a reciprocating approach. He used the word reciprocity. And later on, she coined the phrase dynamic switching. So in different decades, the different primary investigators all came to the same conclusion, which is it's a dynamic construct. So a checklist is not dynamic. It's static. And yet you need to be thinking all the time. So there we are, back to this. Perception, comprehension, projection. And then underlying or covering all of that is the role of goals, expectations, things like this. So we've been through that, and we'll skip ahead. Uh, situational structure, the four factors that sort of permeate all areas of it. And the ones that matter are these two here, role of goals and expectations and inintentional blindness. Now, actually, it's a poor phrase. It should say attentional blindness, but this is the literature. And what we're saying is that there's no perception of the uh, salient data due to a high workload or low expectations or both. You're busy, you're overworked, plus you're not prepared for that incident that comes about. And so your mind's on automatic pilot like that nurse was in my operating room. Okay, just another busy day doing what we always do with the same equipment and the same people and she's on automatic pilot, okay? So. These cognitive errors are universal, they are distinct from procedural and training issues, and they are preventable. At least we think they're preventable. And we talk about expertise and how to expert get around this, pattern recognition, mental stimulation. Let's talk about simulation, very important, which is how do I go through this, what's my data, what if, what if, what if. Let's play that game, let's program that out there. So, summary of limitations. Short-term memory is poor. We have processing delays. Um, our brain seeks efficiencies, hence we have inherent biases. We like shortcuts. Shortcuts cuts down the workload on our memory cache. And of course, fatigue susceptibility. We get tired, okay? So best essay practices, let's get right to the chase. Here's my plea to all of us. Let's have awareness of our learning process, hence metacognition which is thinking about thinking. So when you leave here, the goal is to at least start thinking about the way you think. We have to recognize we have memory limitations. We have to have a new appreciation for perspective. We have to have the capacity for self-critique. You know, could I have done that better? Could our team done that better? And we want to select the biasing strategies, of which there's a whole list. But as you can see, if you think about it, and that's what I want you to do is think about it, you know, think about developing insight, uh, you simulate, you discuss it, okay, all the things you can do to get yourself out of that bias framework. <clears throat> the learning process for this is time spent learning, adequate rehearsal, recall, or excuse me, um, working on recall under stress, and then have some awareness of your limitations, which is about the fourth time I've said that. So you should know that's an important question coming up at the end. And you recognize, and here's some hints, you know, incongru incongruity, ambiguity, atypical presentations, poor data fit. When things don't look right, when you have that little spidey sense that things maybe isn't, are the way they should be, they probably aren't. One of my favorite slides, here's a guy I guarantee you has situational awareness. He is fully comprehending his situation, and he's projecting into the near future what's about to happen to him. Okay. So let's think about that. Here are some tips. Well, you want to, in your organization, in your dive boat, in your operating room, you want to have predetermined roles. You want to plan for problems, 
You can read those. I don't have to read them to you. And this is available, of course, on the talk. But basically, you know, think about what you're doing. How do you know things are going wrong? And this is all lessons from crew resource management. Things are ambiguous. You're fixated on something. Okay, lobster divers fixated on that lobster. Don't see that there's a nice big lionfish right next to his hand. Okay, your dive plan is off. Things don't look good. You're failing to look outward. You're failing to see what's going on around you. You lose your minimums. You're beyond your air reserves. All sorts of things like that. Okay, we don't. Those are red warnings. So, be reflective. Remember that the operator, that you, is active, not passive in his environment. Conscious decision making can control the input. And situational awareness is decision relation is probabilistic. Basically, it's a dynamic construct. Keep your head in the game, keep thinking it through. Well, how do you do that? Great story. Um, Toyota was the former, was the founder of Toyota Medical, or excuse me, uh, automobile. And a little Zen thing there is, if you don't see something right coming down the assembly line, ask yourself five times why. And this was his phrase, coined, coined the phrase, the five whys. And if you can't answer those, if you can't understand why something is going on, maybe it's time to call a stop. Okay, maybe you need to you know, blow that safety whistle. There we go. Everybody remember that picture? Okay, the shuttle. Remember what happened? They broke their standards, okay? It was too cold, the O-rings froze, there was a leak, kaboom, all righty. Normalization of deviance. They had gotten by with it before. The temperature had been below 40 degrees before, so they got, this time it was I think around 33, but they got by with it at 38, 36, so one more time it's okay. And yet Morton Thiokol told them over and over again, don't do this. Well, there you go. So you don't accept the normalization of deviance. If somebody is not following the safety sequence, you stop and call them out on it. Okay. <clears throat> on the Columbia, reliance on past success, right? Gambler's fallacy didn't happen to us last time, so it's not going to happen to us this time. Ineffective communication, uh, you didn't want to listen to differences of opinion. That's called an authority gradient, for those of you who like psychobabble, all right? And we see what happens. So the ABCs of teamwork, assertiveness, buck that authority gradient. Briefings, briefings are great. Make sure they're detailed, make sure they're specific, make sure they're relevant to what you're doing. A checklist, which helps you focus on those efficiencies, but keep in mind its limitations. And finally, situational awareness. So my little friend there, for our summary, it's looking out at us. And uh, I leave you with these thoughts. Be reflective, think about what you do. Understand that we can all fail. Remember the five whys, nice little thing to keep in your hip pocket on a daily basis. The ABCs, assertiveness, briefings, checklist, and situational awareness. All righty, and there we go. So that finishes the talk. And I have only two questions for you. One of the three components of situational awareness are perception, comprehension, awareness, and the remedial class in short-term memory will be next door as soon as I'm done with this talk. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, finally, remember that you're fallible. And thank you very much. I appreciate your help. I'm open for questions if we have time. <laughs>